Hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. This is Anne P of Fiber, Floss, and Fiction. Today is Thursday the 12th of November 2020. So welcome to all. If you are a new viewer, uh, I hope that you have a reason to hit the subscribe button and come back and visit with me again and of course enjoy this podcast. And for my returning viewers, thank you as always for taking some time to hang out with me today. Um, I'm hoping this won't be quite quite as long as usual, but let's see. We'll find out, you and I, together. Um, my usual set of stuff, I'm going to talk about knitting and then books and reading and then cross-stitch at the end. Um, Timestamps are down below in case there's certain sections that you like better than others and just want to kind of focus on those. So let's talk about knitting. I have a couple of finished items to share with you guys. And let's start with the socks. These are the Intersections socks. The pattern is available through uh, Lane Publications' 52 Weeks of Socks book. It was out of print. It is now back in print. Um, the Wooly Thistle here on, um, she actually does podcasts, but the, the store online, um, she has copies of, uh, think they're either pre-order or they may even be available to order and ship right away but at any rate it's got 52 sock patterns in them um, some are a little bit plainer these are obviously nicely cabled um, I did make some alterations to this pattern uh, the pattern was originally knit from the toe up and had a flap heel which uh, I don't mind the flap heel but I'm not a huge fan of toe up socks so converted these to be um, cuff down so I cast on here uh, work the cuff and the cable pattern I inserted a fish lips kiss heel on these and then worked um, just kind of my normal boxy toe uh, really fun to knit um, I will say that um, it is helpful to go up like half a needle size so I would have normally knit these on US ones and I went up to 1.5s to knit the leg because the the cable part of the the leg doesn't stretch as much. Um, it's not as big a deal down here on the foot where you've got the stockinette to kind of correct your gauge back to what you normally think of as your gauge. But yeah, I just felt that these were going to be too tight otherwise. And so I just bumped up to do that for these. And since I knit them on um, two short circulars, I could actually keep pretty easy, pretty easily keep the top done in uh, on 1.5s and then do the stockinette on ones, which wound up working out pretty much perfectly. These are a really good fit on me. Um, yarn, Heritage Sock Yarn from Cascade Yarns. Um, it's their kind of standard 75 percent superwash merino 25 percent nylon good sock yarn base um, I hadn't worked with it before and it's very very soft uh, I really like it and this colorway is lilac it's just a nice kind of blurple lighter blurple so there are those they are finished and with this I finished my ordinary wizarding level for Arthmancy uh, Arithmancy, however one says that, uh, for the Harry Potter group on Ravelry, which the challenge there was to knit eight socks uh, that were not just kind of plain, plain vanilla socks. I'm not sure if there's too much glare there or not. I may close that for our next section, but um, let's talk about finish number two. If I turn this a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Um, this is the Vanilla Fog Hat. The pattern is by Drea Renee Knits, so Andrea Mowry. And this is a brioche, single color brioche hat. Uh, the pattern actually has you color block it. And um, it's kind of fun because you can use up uh, sock yarn scraps. It's knit at a DK weight, but uh, the yarn that I used actually I have a feeling I'm going to be fighting the sun a lot. Um, hang on, I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Since we've undergone our 
fall back time change here in our part of the United States. Uh, I'm all cattywampus about when I film and how the light's going to come in that window, so I think it was getting a little too harsh. Anywho, back to the Vanilla Fog hat. Um, so this is two uh, different colors of sock weight yarn held together. The first one is was a very pale um, speckle dyed sock yarn that had kind of very, very pale teals. It, you can see there's some little pops of some dark rose in there um, and some darker teals and blues. And then I held it with a solid color of teal, um, also sock yarn, to get the DK weight. And the pattern calls for you to use one main color and then choose two different types of sock yarns to kind of color block it. But I had enough with the leftover that I had from a pair of socks to um, make this entire hat from it. And it's I knitted the length or the depth that the pattern called for. So single color brioche, um, super, super stretchy and very warm and it's exceptionally squishy in the way brioche is. Um, if you haven't worked with brioche before, the pattern doesn't really come with any tutorials per se, but it's very clear and you can probably fudge your way through it or, you know, hop on YouTube and you can watch, there's tons of different videos. I personally like um, Very Pink, Stacy of Very Pink, I like her videos. Um, and she talks about this, but Brooklyn Tweed also has a brioche single color in the round um, video tutorial. So yeah. Um, I have a teal colored pom-pom that's coming, but it isn't here yet. So I'm calling this one done because I'll, I'll pop the pom-pom um, on the top and then that'll be available to wear. The nice thing about this type of hat is, uh, or this type of pattern, is that it's so super squishy and stretchy that it really would pretty much fit anybody. Um, I mean, not little kids, but any adult. So... Yeah, so that was fun and stash busting, which I'm all about. So those are my two finishes for this go round. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what I'm working on. I am still working on blanket squares, um, but not anything exciting to report. I will show you more of those maybe when I have the whole stack finished and it's ready to seam. So in the meantime, I have been working on uh, this project, which is the Titania Shawl. It's going to be really hard to see because it's all bunched up on the needles. But I have finished the lace part of it, and I am working on this plain stockinette part that is the, at the center back and is kind of a crescent shape. It's very hard to see, I think, but oh no, they're actually showing up okay. There's um, little clear silver lined beads on this. This project is at the point where it just looks like a nasty dish rag. It will not really look like anything until it's blocked. Um, a couple caveats about this. So this is the Titania Shawl by Susanna IC. Uh, as always, I'll link pattern information below. This shawl was huge uh, in the sample and bigger than I would want it for me or normal size people, I think. Um, certainly it will grow quite a bit. It is lace weight. It has lots of open work. So it will grow when it's blocked, uh, but I'm not expecting it to be as big as the original. I dropped down a needle size to work this, um, and I was much happier with the, the fabric, but it will be less airy. I mean, you can see it's perfectly perfectly airy as it is. So um, we'll see what size this winds up being. Um, the yarn is from a company that no longer hand dyes called Rainy Days and Woolly Dogs. And this is her Gothamer Lace, which is 100% superwash merino. And the colorway is Ancient Celts for that dark blue. So I'm going to tell you guys a little quick story here that is going to involve a horse 
and you'll hopefully see what I'm talking about when I get through it. But um, this is my boy Ben and me. Uh, this was a ride that we did on Antelope Island, which is in the Great Salt Lake. And you basically started at the north end, you rode down to the ranch in the south end, and then you turned around and went back to the, the north end. And that was, that was the, the ride. Um, ben and I were very much alike. Um, we both like to eat the same exact things every day. We never got bored training on the same like we could ride a five mile loop 10 times. It didn't, it didn't bother either of us. It was just like, that was the task. We were going to go get it done. Um, and I'm not sure what was in his wiring, but about mile 35 to 37 on a 50 mile race, he would get very checked out. He just was not that interested. And the first time that this happened, I was like, wow, I, you know, we haven't conditioned enough. He's tired, da, 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 da. Mile 43, that horse found his low gear and was like, yep, we're almost done. Let's get, or let's just get this finished. And Ben and I are very much alike with that. I had started this project for a challenge and I thought, well, I'm, I mean, it's, it's going to wind up being close to 800 yards. I thought, I'm not going to get it done with everything else I'm trying to get finished. I'm working on the sample knit. I'm doing all this other stuff. And I real I looked at my calendar and realized how many days I had left to work on this, which is through the 22nd. And apparently I hit mile 43 in my 50 miles because now I'm just like, I don't care. I'm going to get this done. I'm just like, Every spare minute I have, this is what I'm working on, and I will get it done by the 22nd. I really don't have that much more to go. Um, let's see if I can show you guys. So this section right here, um, I'm working short rows, which means I am not working all the way to the end of the row. I will work part of the way into this row, and then I turn the work and I work back to the other end where there is an equal amount kind of waiting over here to have those stitches eaten up as I work back and forth. And that's what makes this pretty kind of crescent uh, shape. You can see how the uh, triangle of this is getting wider. So this is what I have left. Now, yes, the rows are long. There's like 200 stitches every time I go back and forth, but I have two, three, four, Seven, eight, nine. I have nine, nine times two. So I have 18 more rows left to finish, one plain row to knit, and then I can bind off. So I'm pretty sure that I can get this done and hopefully we'll have it to show you next time, completely blocked, not looking like a sad scrunched up dishcloth. Okay, that's it for knitting. Um, I don't really have any plans per se. Uh, I'm obviously gonna keep working on that shawl. If I get that one done, I'm going to go back to working on some blanket squares. And like I said, I have a sample knit that I'm working on right now. So those will be my focus. Um, my mom has also requested a cowl uh, for the holiday season, although she says no brush whenever. But it would be nice to kind of get that off my plate as well. So I might have that to show you next time if I get that cast on. We'll see how long everything else takes. Um, but yeah. That's it for knitting, so we're going to go ahead and talk about books next. So I have four books, four books to talk to you all about this week. Um, let's start with the Audible book that I just finished, which was called um, Blackberry and Wild Rose. Uh, I will put links to the Goodreads pages for books like I normally do down below in case you have interest in in reading them or seeing more information about them. Um, I believe the author's name for that book uh, is Sonia Veschel or Vichel. So the book is a historical fiction. It is set in uh, London, in, well the Spitalfield section of London uh, in the 1760s. It covers most of a year and the book is told with two um, main characters and the chapters alternate be between Sarah and Esther. 
Um, Esther is the wife of a well-respected and well-to-do. They're definitely like middle-class merchants um, who are, um, he and his family were Hu French Huguenots originally who emigrated to England to escape r religious persecution and they brought with them the silk weaving trade. So that's what he does. He, he, um, he doesn't hire, but he has basically as contract workers, a number of silk weavers and he pays them by piecework. And he has some that just weave simple, just kind of flat taffetas. And then he has others that weave the brocades and the really beautiful figured silks. And so Esther is his wife. They are childless and um, they have more of like a business relationship type mar marriage where, you know, she takes care of the house and he takes care of the business and they do all the right and proper things. The other character is a young girl, Sarah, who has come to London, her mother has sent her away. We're not sure why at the beginning of this. Um, she's in her late teens. And she arrives in London, gets off the stagecoach with a note um, with her mother. Her mother has given her the address of an old friend to visit in London who can hopefully find her work and like one pound in coin, which was a lot for that time for someone who was basically a, a serving class. And she gets off the stagecoach and this older woman approaches her who appears to be very kind and is going to help her find where her family friend is. But this woman actually runs a brothel and she takes Sarah in and winds up uh, drugging her with opium and basically selling her to the highest bidder and she bidder and she becomes kind of a captive in this in this brothel. Um, she meets Sarah, Sarah and Esther meet each other um, while Sarah is trying to escape the brothel and Esther winds up take, taking pity on her and agreeing to kind of pay off her indebted servitude to this old woman and hires her as a maid in the house, even though really this young woman has very few skills. The uh, middle class matron, she's not even really a matron, she's a young woman, Esther, uh, is an artist and she desperately wants to uh, design silk and her husband completely dismisses her because she's young and she's a woman and what would she know about anything? So the book traces the relationship between these two very different women. Um, it ties in the Weaver's Riots of 1768-69 in London. Uh, interesting information about the Huguenot, Huguenots coming to London and the silk trade and how things were changing with the importation of cheaper goods from China as well as the printed calicos from India. So uh, it's kind of a little microcosm of the textile industry and um, kind of middle-class merchant life in Hogwarts era just before the, the American Revolution. Um, it's not an easy book. Um, there's not a ton of happy endings at the end of it, uh, but I found it very interesting. It's a period of history that I have studied and I tend to like more information about. Um, so well written for that and obviously very well researched and while it doesn't particularly tie into, I mean it ties into the, the Weaver's riots and there certainly were those and court cases involved with that. It doesn't, ref she creates a story that is completely fictitious about this family, but certainly similar things were happening in this area during this time with these classes of people. So um, a good read and I very much enjoyed it as the audible book. It has two separate um, voices that one reads each of the characters. So very nicely done. 
Um, the next book is The Rules of Magic, which is Alice Hoffman's newest book. It is a prequel to Practical Magic. It is also considered historical fiction. It is set briefly in the UK, but mostly in Massachusetts, um, in Salem and on the Cape. During the 1660s, um, it follows about 30 years. So the main character, Maria Owens, um, is the daughter of a witch and she emigrates to the United States with her um, heart on her sleeve, I guess I'm going to say. She's um, fallen in love with this, this gentleman who she decides she has to search out and he is from, um, from Salem. So she figures out how to get passage. She brings with her her um, infant daughter, who is the child of this man she's fallen in love with. And things do not go smoothly or easily for her. And um, she doesn't always make really good life choices. And um, she almost pays for those bad choices with her life. There's some tie-in to the Salem Witch Trials, although she's not directly involved with those. Um, they're kind of at the end of the story. Um, her daughter grows up also to be a witch and also makes some bad choices. Um, this book is very Alice Hoffman, if you like her style of writing. I think it's better than Practical Magic. Um, it has the historical uh, additional historical information in it, so of course I liked it quite a bit. Um, I personally like Alice Hoffman's style of writing. I think the characters are all really engaging. You are pulling for them, you're cheering for Maria and her daughter. By the time you get to the end of the book, you really want them to find happiness. And um, there's all kinds of great uh, like historical tidbits thrown in there. And it's obvious that she's researched a lot of the 17th and 18th century herbals, um, things that would have been simples made to cure a cough or um, love potions or, or what have you. So um, if you enjoyed Practical Magic and, and or are a fan of Hoffman's other books that kind of combine magical realism, uh, you would likely enjoy this one as well. I, uh, I, I won't say it's going to be my favorite book of the year, but it's definitely right up there. It was very good. Okay, the last two books um, are the first and second in a new historical mystery series that I picked up. Um, the first is called The Anatomist's Wife, and the second, which is book two in the series, is called Mortal Arts. And the author is Anna Lee Huber, I believe is how she says her last name. Um, these are set kind of differently in 1830. Um, I know a lot of the historical mysteries are set either in the Regency period or much later, like turn of the century. Don't let the book covers fool you because the artist has depicted her as wearing like 1890s clothing, but they are set in the 1830s, so maybe they didn't know what that kind of clothing looked like. I don't know. Um, the main character is a young woman who's the youngest daughter of three children. She has been married to um, an anatomist, a surgeon, who has risen to the title of Lord because apparently he took a lesion off of the Prince Regent's scalp and so he's been knighted for that. And it was an arranged marriage. Her only qualification was she wanted to be able to continue painting. She's an artist and a very talented artist. Uh, so her father marries her off to this older gentleman who's recently been knighted and who is a surgeon in Edinburgh. During this time period, just to set the stage, our, um, a, a major trial came to a head over two men who had basically, they had originally just, and I put that in quotes, just been grave robbers. Um, the University of Edinburgh's medical school was trying to find cadavers to dissect and the only ones they could get were criminals who had been put to death. 
and that wasn't a big enough pool. So what wound up happening is the resurrectionists or body snatchers had begun robbing graves and compounding this crime. These two men had decided that it was just much quicker to find somebody that they could poison um, or suffocate or in some way do away with, and then they could take the body and sell it to the medical college. So there had been this horrible uproar over not only these two men, but anyone associated with dissections, and that included the anatomists at the college. What we find out is her husband married her not for any reason except that she was an amazing artist and he wanted to uh, attempt to publish a book that showed uh, all the details of human body parts in dissections and that's why he married her. So he has since passed away from an apoplexy and she has basically been shunned by society so she has moved back in with, or she's moved in with her eldest sister and her brother-in-law who live in the highlands of Scotland and are very remote. Um, they decide to give a garden party here in the first book and that kicks off a chain of events because one of the guests is found murdered and she's asked to assist in determining cause of death. So that's the premise of both of these books. Um, the things I liked about it, the characters are really nicely drawn. Obviously, since I like got book two and had to read that immediately after and I have started book three, um, I really enjoyed these. I love her character. Um, the other kind of main character in the story is this gentleman who is um, has been hired. He also happens to be at this initial house party, but he is someone who investigates crimes. So since he's there, it's kind of natural the two of them work together. They have a slightly prickly relationship. Um, but I did appreciate the fact that this author obviously has done her research on the Napoleonic Wars and post-Regency period um, society. Uh, things that are much more Scotland oriented, like the locks and the geography and the castles. And it's just a very different feel than one mysteries that are set in the urban area of London. So highly recommend those if you like historical mysteries. Um, I think there's eight or maybe nine in the series, so you'll likely see more of those to come as we go along. Um, I'm almost done the book called The Man Called Ove by Friedrich Bachmann. Um, absolutely loving it. If you haven't read it, I think it's going to be one of my top books of the year. It's it's wonderful. Um, I have not seen the movie. I think there's a movie of it. The print version I'm very much enjoying. So we'll report on that next time as well as um, the other couple of things that I'm in the process of if I get, if I get those done. So that's going to be it for books this go round. Let's go on and we're going to talk about cross stitch. Okay, so cross stitch. What have I been working on? Um, less projects this go round because I have really, really been focusing on trying to meet my goal on Once Upon a Fairy Tale for my stitch 20 and 20. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk first about Trick or Treat Fairy. This is the piece that um, is available as a Hirschner's download. It is a Nora Corbett design. And I am stitching this on a 28 count linen from Color and Cotton called Antique Peach. And I got quite a bit done on her. This insists upon showing much, much greener on the screen. It's actually kind of a peachy tan, but uh, we, oh, anyway, <laughs> you can still see it. Uh, I got a lot done on her. Um, I brought down um, the edge of her skirt, so I kind of have that as a mark now. I came up and I finished her face with the back stitching, added in the arms, um, added in most of the owl. I have a couple of stitches that would need to get filled in there. So pretty much, other than the, the moon, pretty much she's 
done from here up except for the beads and this this design does have a lot of, of beads like all of this in the sky is beads she's got beads in her headdress they're the streamers here that that's all beads um, so I did start don't know that it's gonna show up but this is actually uh, a metallic it's a Krynek it's a like blackish red so I don't know that you can see it, but it is the first half of Treat. So I've gotten that started, <clears throat> excuse me. And like I said, I have brought the skirt down, so I kind of have that to there. So I can figure out where I need to go from here down. Um, again, there's a lot of beatings, beating. And sorry for the sun there. Uh, the metallics here. The pumpkins are a regular cross stitch and uh, as are her legs, um, but I actually don't have that much more plain cross stitch to do on her. There's just, there's a lot of other stuff which makes her fun with all the sparkles. Um, Sarah over at uh, Stitch and Mommy is working on um, this as well. Um, it's always just fun to see like what fabrics other people pick and you know, all that good stuff that you do to personalize it so that is where she is and that was super fun to work on for dark october stitching at the end of the month i hadn't really participated with that but it was great to be able to do that the 30th and 31st sorry trying not to throw stuff on the floor um i actually have not worked on this next project since i last talked to you but i realized that I worked on it and then didn't bring it to show you. And that is my Long Dog Samplers. Sampler, the Pilgrim. Here is what it will look like when it is finished. And I am work, I started here. So I have this page done and I've come this way. So I'm now working on like this section. I have not started the seahorse, but I'm working on the border. So I really have only been putting in like a day or so on this. So not a ton of focused time on it, but um, I've worked on it, I think twice since the last time I showed you and did not bring it with me to let you see. So here is where it is currently. Again, this is that middle page, which is finished and I'm down here working on this corner page. So I've reached the corner and I've started up. This is where that big seahorse will live when I get there. I'm stitching this one over one, uh, one over two on the 36 count linen uh, from Crosswing Designs. The colorway is butternut. And then the, the floss is a silk from Silks For You. I think it's 204, but it might be 209. It's just, um, really soft set of periwinkles, purples and blurples and blues. So um, this will come out for a day, probably next week, um, just to get a little bit more time in on it, but I don't have any specific like goal that I was shooting for on that one. It's just been out a little bit every so often. And then lastly, my focus for the last pretty much 10, 10, 11 days has been um, Once Upon a Fairy Tale. So here's the mock-up of it. It's a heaven and earth design, um, artwork by Amy Stewart. I am doing the super size max color version. And I am very happy to say that I met my 20,000 stitch goal in 2020. And here it is. So this is the center bottom. And I've worked over and done the lady with the sword. And I've worked this way this time. And I've got most of the gargoyle finished. Um, I just clicked over 20,000 stitches on this last night. So technically this was my goal for the year. I am going to continue to 
work on that because I am using it for a letter or a word prompt in full coverage fanatics we're doing our wheel of fortune challenge this month and I've done two words already on it so far and I think the word I'm working on now is pumpkins which has eight letters so I had a total of 2,000 stitches to put in it and I have about 1100 left to meet that smaller goal so I'm thinking I will probably work on that for the next three to four days depending on how things go today's been like the first day this week that I've had any time to sit and take a breath it's been like just it's just been crazy errands and appointments and phone calls and long days um, so we'll see how that goes but when I get that one that word finished I will take a break from that one because yay for goal meeting um, and I probably won't work on that again this year I think um, let me look really quick no, I do not have it out for anything, um, any prompts or anything in, in December. Um, I think December may be the month that I work on a long winter's nap quite a bit, uh, but stay tuned on that. We will see. Um, I have some floating around plans for December, but I'm pretty sure that one will come out. Um, so after I have finished my stitches on Once Upon a Fairy Tale. I'm going to put a day or so in on The Pilgrim, which you just saw. And then uh, I think at the end of the month, I'm going to focus on uh, starting uh, Adele Sessler's Beloved, which is another full covered coverage piece. Um, it's one that I wanted to start this year, and so I think I'm going to give that, give that a go to get going on it. Um, not sure what else I'll work on this month. Uh, I'm kind of at that point where I've met a lot of my goals and so um, I'm not feeling necessarily like pressured to, oh my gosh, I got to get that out and get, you know, get some stitches in on it, which is kind of nice, let's just say. Uh, I don't know if you all took the opportunity to watch the planning video that Kim, who is Kim Hollenbach on FlossTube and Spartan Stitcher on Instagram, posted on Sunday, but if you haven't, go and have a look at that because she has so much good information in it and lots of good tidbits about planning for 2021. So uh, again, I am going to do a whip parade next month in December, but uh, I had been tossing some different ideas around and talking back and forth with Kim about, you know, what I wanted to do for next year and things I wanted to focus on and you know where I was with the whole list of of whips and so after I watched her video I went back and looked at some of the stuff I had been doing for planning purposes and looking ahead for 2021 so here's what I pretty much have written in stone that I've decided on now um, I'm gonna take my non full coverage whips and I have two that I'm probably going to put in time out for a while, and I'll talk about that more in my whip parade. But um, what I decided would be helpful for me, because I did want to whittle down my non-full coverage pieces next year, and I also want to get more progress on my full coverage pieces, especially since I've started several this year. Um, I'm going to pick four of my non-full coverage pieces and those are going to be kind of my focus pieces for next year. I'm not saying I won't work on anything else at all but chances are good these are the four that you will see and I'm going to divide them up so the first quarter I'll work on one um, for 10 days each month. <laughs> so a total of 30 days on each of these projects. Now I think for sure one of them possibly two will will be done at like within those 30 days because they're not as big um the other two less likely to be done but i think i can still make some major progress on them which would would be great so for quarter one i'm gonna go back and focus on joan elliott's celtic wheel i have half of that left to do i'm at the 50 percent mark on that so that will be out 
quarter one. Quarter two, I'm going to focus on the Drawn Thread uh, Summer Garden, which is not very far along, but it's also not a huge project. So I'm hoping I might be able to even get that one done. Uh, quarter three, I'm going to go and work on Halloween Fairy. And I am fairly certain with 30 days worth of work, I will not only have finished her, but I will have some spare days to play around with um, when I'm finished her within that. And then for the final quarter of the year, I'm going to work on my Chatelaine on Desert Mandala and see if I can't get quite a bit of that middle tier completed um, and kind of set myself up for success with a finish in 2022 on that one. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to have 10 days a month and then I'm going to work on that kind of focus, non-full coverage piece. Then I've got about... 20 days a month to do other things with and my plan is to use those days to focus on the books challenge uh, challenges that we'll have each month in the full coverage fanatics group um, I will link to that group below if you're not a member and do full coverage please come join us um, so what I've done there is I've opted to pick one book's worth of stitches a month um, each month we have three books set up. Realistically, I will not get through all three books. Um, but, you know, it's around two to 3,000 stitches a month on a, any given project. Um, and so I've sorted those out by theme. So, for instance, the first month in January, we've got um, classics. And one of the prompts for that, if you're not doing counting, is um, Fancy Ladies. So I'm going to use a stitching shelf for that one because it's got all the different vignettes in there. Um, and I think the book, I just picked the first first book that we have listed. So I think there's like 1900 stitches to do to hit that number goal. And based on, and this goes back to Kim's video where, you know, it, she, let me back up and say she has much, 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 much better record keeping skills than I do. I have kept some things, but there's been some times where I haven't wanted to count my stitches and I've just been a little bit flaky about it. I do know though that I can get about a thousand stitches done on a full coverage piece in three days. So taking that number and knowing that I'll have 20 days a week to work on full coverage projects means if I can put in my normal amount, I'm looking at around 6,000 stitches a month, which would be fantastic. That would be a great amount of progress on whatever I pick. Um, so once I meet that book challenge, I have a couple of options every other month in Full Coverage Fanatics, right? We've got those monthly challenges that go the whole month. So I'll use that time to work on whatever that challenge is. It's bingo in January and um, I think it's history month in March and so on and so forth. The months that I have just a weekend focus piece um, for those challenges, that's great. I'll go ahead and you know work on whatever that challenge is, but it will also give me a lot of other days where if I'm close to a page finish, then I can try for that. Or if there's something that I specifically want to work on, then it'll give me more time to do that as well. I don't really foresee a lot of new starts next year uh, of any kind. I'm not really doing the No New Starts 21, but um, I do want to kind of, this goes back if you watched the clip from my knitting, um, I'm kind of at mile 43 with a lot of things that I just want to see them through to the end. And I'm hoping that like it will help me pick up steam and zip my way to the finish line if I have kind of focused in on a smaller number of pieces. Kim alludes to that in her video. I mean, we all know, right? The more pieces you have, if you're trying to get through all of them, the less time you can spend on any of them. Um, whereas if you are just looking at a smaller group, then if that is what your focus is at that point in time, then you can put the stitches into that piece and see more progress. All right, so I think that's it for me rambling today. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope that you've enjoyed spending some time with me. I hope you are staying well in your corner of the world. Um, my husband and I talked about 
going camping over Thanksgiving and our current COVID rate is I think to about 1200 a day of new cases here in New Mexico so we are not going anywhere. I just don't have a comfort level for that so um, we had our organic farm um, delivery today and we got a turkey so that's in the freezer and we'll haul that out and we'll just be here for here for the holiday um, which will be fine. Um, he and I in, enjoy that and it's kind of fun to you know have the day to cook and um, just relax and we're both going to take some time off from work so it'll be nice. Um, but anyway, I hope you are staying safe wherever you are in the world and um, that you continue to do so. So please do all the smart things, stay safe and stay well, and I will talk to you, it'll probably be right after Thanksgiving actually, maybe even that weekend. So until then, bye for now.